Okay, so when we last left off before the computer uh, did what the computer loves to do, I was talking about rodents, I was, fed, I was focusing in on the family Muridae, the old world rodents, talking about the three bad ones, Radus radus, Radus dobigicus, and Musculus, and how to tell if some of these things are part. Uh, this is a list of, of, of signs that you know you have pest rodents, and this is going to be probably, without a doubt, the most common sense list you ever saw. Sight, if you see them, if you hear them, hearing them is, is the big one. Usually in the evenings, you can hear them scratching in attics and, and the walls. Of course, if you have, remember, they are rodents, they got to gnaw, they're going to gnaw. And you'll see gnaw marks on stuff, especially they'll try to widen holes, things like that. Uh, nesting material, they, uh, if, if they're in your attic, what they'll do is they'll move the insulation and build nesting material. They'll also bring stuff in from outside. The nest is really easy to see because not only is the nest there, but also the burrows that go through it. Uh, and, uh, the, and dog and cat alert. I, again, I think I mentioned the story that when I lived in Memphis, we had roof rats. I had a cat that would go absolutely crazy when you'd hear it in the attic. And found his big, huge cat. His name was Norman. You know, one of those cats you could see holes through his ears and all that because he was a fighter from way back. I watched him blind a dog once. He sat there and this dog came running at him and he didn't move. At the last minute, he blinded the dog. One shot. Norman was cool. Anyway, so what I did was I would open the attic and Norman would go running up there and then he'd bring down dead rats. It was like the greatest cat ever. I digress. Talk about my buddy Norman. Okay, and then <clears throat> the big one, of course, is the one that's probably the least one we like to do look at, and that's uh, droppings and urine stains. Okay, so, so again, this is a potential pathogenic problem here too. Besides just being a mess, these are this is a drop ceiling like we have here, and of course with them running around, they set up. They often set up latrines, like places where they go and, and pee or poop all the time, and you, you can see these different spots here. This is next to a computer. You can see it's been running along here. This is, that's probably the number one thing to watch for are the poops. Again, they look like little tiny black rice. Uh, they're not very clean animals, so they tend to carry a lot of oil and dirt on them, and so you can see rub spots okay. on, on their, their marks where they're going. Okay. The other thing, too, is uh, they, so they're, so they're putting out all this organic matter in terms of poop. They don't all live, they die of certain things. So you start watching for what we call indicator pests, other pests here. So uh, for those of you in my uh, invertebrate class, my uh, medical and veterinary, these are some classic ones here. We've talked about some of these. This is the blowfly, family Califordi. Blowflies, we see them around here all the time. They're shiny. They're the first responders to anything dead. And if something dies in the wall, the blowflies will find it. And these other ones are called hide beetles. Uh, hide beetles love, the, so uh, hide beetles that you find in nature are often called carpet beetles, things like that, that eat things. I keep hide beetles for uh, cleaning my skulls and all that. We've all seen the hide beetles over there. Uh, so uh, that, that's, uh, now, that you start seeing these things in your house, you know you've got a problem. There are certain insects that will tell you all kinds of stories. Um, I was mentioning to the other class that about this little fly called the moth fly. And it's a cute little thing, won't bother anybody else, but if you see it, it means your sewer line's broken. So there's all sorts of, so, so if you see blow flies in your house, something died. Okay, now, not just come, come in the window and all that, or you left the door open while you were uh, cooking or something, they might come in. But if you start seeing them around, uh, it's, it's telling you something down there. Okay. Uh, the other thing too is they'll they uh, so if, you, if you're using rodenticides, and of course I'm I'm against using baits for many reasons, and I'll talk about that. You, then you know they're going to die in your house somewhere. Uh, another thing too is they uh, rats are and especially mice not as much. They'll, they'll cache food, they'll hide things. And if they're getting grain, these are a couple of them. If you start finding grain moths uh, that aren't in your corn flour or your 
cornmeal or someplace else, then they might be coming out of the walls where these things hide grain. So the big thing is how to take care of them. Uh, they probably love dumpsters more than anything else. These, this is a classic dumpster, dumpsters overfilled or dumpsters that have holes in them. So again, you know, all dumpsters have a hole on the bottom. It's good so they can drain, but that should have a screen mesh over it. Uh, these are just rotted off dumpsters here. Uh, the dumpsters on, on concrete makes it harder for them the, the, the right threats to get into them. If they're on grass and things like that, there's, then they're, they're more protected. Okay. The screen drain holes, I mentioned that. Uh, and of course, they should be emptied. And of course, we're, we're at a university, and if you live in any of the dorms and all that, you see the dumpsters outside, they're about never, they kind of always kind of look like that. So it, it can be a real problem. Uh, yeah, all this is just basically common sense. You know, again, if you can you know, get rid of places that they live, garbage they live in, things that they might feed on, and that's basically how you're going to take care of them. They're going to live inside of houses. They like to be warm just like you like to be warm. They are a commensal species. So just anything that you've got is kind of like that. Uh, uh, basically, one of the, is, is filling all the holes that you might see these things produce. Uh, and uh, what's often used is people will stuff steel wool in them. Do not do that. Steel wool will not deter them. On top of that, steel wool rusts and is gone in no time. So this is, here, this is using a copper fiber uh, or something else to, to, to stuff those holes. Those they won't deal with here. Stuff it, uh, copper wash or stainless steel, uh, wool, not regular steel wool. Won't do, be doing that. Okay. Seal it, of course, and then check it off and make sure it stays sealed so they don't really open it up. This is a, a crawl in space that was under a, a, a light fixture. And of course, once they get inside the, the walls the, between the studs, then they can go anywhere they want. Okay. Traps. I'm very big on using traps. I like traps. Uh, some people don't because it's not very convenient. These are a couple different examples of traps. You see them all the time. Uh, there's a big common one now for rats is a big black square box. You may see it, sometimes you'll see them. I think there's a few on campus too. Uh, uh, next to buildings, uh, again, like this one, this is, this is a, a standard uh, uh, mouse trap here. These nice things about these traps is they're, they're multiple use. You get, in other words, you can catch many more than one mouse here. This is a clue. Cool, uh, Clap trap, they hit that, and of course it closes down on them. And that's the standard Victor trap there, uh, which has been used for bazillions of years. Uh, they are effective, they are reusable, so that's kind of nice. Uh, and what you find is, you know, should you put out a trap? Well, put out a lot of traps, unless you really know exactly where that mouse is going to go or that rat is going to go. Do check them often, because, uh, so, like out at the so I have uh, it where you know at my the beetle barn. Uh, I have traps out there now, uh, and of course they're, I check them every day. Uh, but in the back room, I didn't have traps before, and some of the people that were doing uh, they had a side project putting together an entire goat. Uh, they lost the front legs, the humeruses, because the mice ate them. So, yeah, so now we've been trapping the other rooms here, and of course I didn't expect, I thought they'd be done a lot quicker than they were. Anyway, say where to put a trap is key. I've talked a little bit about this, so this is a good time to focus in on that. Okay, so the trap should always be up against the wall. Remember, the rodents are going to travel along the wall. This is a good place here because I can see the hole right in here. This is a standard, it's known as a snap trap or Victor trap here, and that's, uh, I don't tend to use cheese, but it was made for a good picture. Put a big chunk of cheese on there. Okay. Okay. And the bait side of the trap is what you want to touch the wall. Uh, they will be running through here. This is not how I would set for a rat, by the way. It's just for picture purposes. I'll show you now. You don't trap them the same. They're a little bit different. Remember, why are they different? If you remember back, I talked about behavior. They are completely different in terms of their approach to the world. So, uh, okay, so basically, uh, 
you can one thing you can do is you can bait with what they're eating or what they're using to nest. And in general, I bet would bet you nine times out of ten you have no clue either one of these things. You don't know what they're eating. So what do you do instead? Peanut butter. Okay. I use peanut butter and I often so a stick trouble with peanut butter is it kind of melts down and gets kind of messy. So if you mix peanut butter with oatmeal, you can make a little tiny ball out of it. And that's that's one of the best baits for either one of these things. Okay, mites, the trip is bait, will you get ready to do it? Bait and set as many traps as possible. Okay, line the walls, set them up as best you can. Okay. And assume that if you've seen a couple, if you've seen a mouse, six traps. If you see two mice, put out 12 traps. This is not a hardcore number. But the point is I'm getting at is you need a lot of traps okay, for mice. Okay. Mice traps are pretty cheap, so it's not that big. Okay. Uh, about three feet apart, you set them. So this, uh, again, this, you don't know where the mouse is going to be. Uh, they, remember, they, they like to explore things, move all around here. And when you're setting them, basically, you can with mice. If you want to just, if you don't want to worry about, it, just set them and put them out. Okay. But you'll often find that the best way. And again, this is if uh, so. Uh, when we, if you remember correctly, when we set traps, this is for all animals. We set live traps. Some of you helped me with live traps. We, uh, and I needed a, to see what I could catch on a Saturday morning. We started setting live traps on Thursday. Okay. And we allowed animals to get used to them. Okay. And then on Saturday morning, we had an excellent success rate. It's, it works the same way here. And so you put the traps out, maybe bait them, and don't set them, and let the animals uh, come leave them unset and rebate them for a day or two, and then you go for your kill day. You put them out and set them all and see how many you can get. Because they've now made this part of their life to go to these traps here. On rats, okay, again, more traps the better. The setting is completely different this time, though, okay. You must, I mean, if you don't must, you can do whatever you want, it's America, I don't care. But if you don't want to be wasting your time, you put these out, set your traps. If you got rats, it take a little bit more work. Put your traps out, unset and baited until you start seeing them being used a lot. Remember, these are extremely wary animals, okay? So, and then after a while, then you bait and set all of your traps. Okay. The, uh, you don't set these three feet apart. We use what's called the three trap trick, okay? This is the three trap trick. You set three traps, put, put three traps out. These two are baited on each side, but not set. Okay. The one in the middle is set. Okay. And so they'll come up, and the idea is they'll, they'll come up to the trap and feed on, on the bait here. And either side that they feed from, then they got the feeling that it gives them uh, confidence. They hit the trap in the middle, and then you got them. So that's this is a tree standard set to get rid of uh, mice. Uh, rats, rather. Right? Okay. okay, rodenticide. Okay, so we all so pesticide is a big word. Okay, pesticide is killing any sort of animal, okay, and that includes insects. So generally, when you say pesticide, you're often talking about insects when you mention that. So that's why we use the term rodenticide, because we, so you know exactly what you're after here. Okay. I'm dead set against it. I, I should, it should be your last resort, but unless you're, I'm not sure I can think of a time when you should be using this because of the problems this causes. Okay. Okay. One of the problems is what's called primary or secondary poisoning. This is a big problem. So again, traps are stupid. Traps don't know when a rodent is there or not. And so you put out the peanut butter, there's some dogs that like peanut butter, or the pack, that, that's, that would be primary poison. If your dog were to eat that, or cat, or other animal that you weren't after would eat it, the poison, that's primary poison. Also what happens is secondary poison. Okay. So you've got a dead, your rat goes and dies somewhere, and another animal eats it. Okay. That's basically what's happening with this dog here. It's, it's, it's been poisoned because it ate a, an animal that had been poisoned. Okay. The other thing too, and I see this all the time, uh, and, and we always use this word when I talk about 
the label is the law. Okay? So it says on the thing I should be putting out two or three of these. Okay, let's put out eight or ten. No, you get again. It's, you're dealing with something that, uh, that the poisons, the toxins, are work on are designed to work on the nerve systems of rats and mice, which are completely and totally identical to your nerve system. Okay. The only difference between what makes and, and your dog's nerve system, your cat, the only thing that separates this from killing you or your pets or whatever is if you follow the instructions. Okay. So the instructions are set up to try to minimize any sort of death by accident. So the label is the law. Okay, so that finishes up my rodents. Okay, if you talk about rodents, you've got to talk about their sister family. Okay, so, uh, so the sister order. So, so Demacrodentia and an order very similar to it, but we know they're not the same because we've taken mammalogy. And that's Ligomorpha. And this is a Ligomorph here. So, okay. so who are in this group here? Rabbits, hares, and pikas. In the United States, we have all three. In this part of the country, we just have rabbits. In the south, uh, western part of the country, there are hares. Specifically, a jackrabbit is not really a rabbit, it's a hare. And the pikas are up in the mountains. So again, distribution. Uh, they are, uh, ligomorphs you could find pretty much everywhere in the world as usual, uh, except Australasia and of course, nothing's in an article here. So, um, they, they have been introduced to Australia, and for a while, back in the 1960s, they were a major destructive force in the country. Okay, on the continent, I should say. Wipe, they were, rabbits were everywhere, wiping out all sorts of stuff, uh, vegetation-wise and all that. They are now under control. But does anybody know how the rabbits were controlled? Get that story? Good one for you. Okay. They introduce a pathogen that kills them. So basically, they yeah. So I, I mean, if you go to Australia, it's a it's a complete disaster. They have because of things have been introduced. Right now, they have the same problem, but it's not with uh, lagomorphs. It's with cats. Okay. So uh, we talk about feral cats as being a problem. Uh, we get nothing compared to what's happening in Australia right now. I know about the war that they had against the kangaroos. Okay. Yep. This came, we have the kangaroos. At least were native, you know. So uh, cane toads were another problem there. They were brought in for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and then they got rid of the cane toad. It was a big, huge toad by introducing a beetle. And this beetle, the the cane toads like to eat the beetle, but they would swallow it whole, and then the beetle was tough enough to crawl right out through their sides. So very, very alien type thing. So it was killing the cane toads by crawling out. Anyway, that's enough on that. So, okay, so who are this? Should we look familiar to you all right now? Okay, so we know that they are closely related to Rodentia. This is the this is the head of this is a uh, domestic rabbit. Okay, and the key characteristic we've talked about in lab is the rostrum. It's highly fenestrated, so that's a key characteristic. Also, uh, the incisors are not like a rodent is one one with with no pre, uh, with no uh, canines, so so there'd be one zero one zero. These guys are two one zero zero. So they have two uh, incisors on the bottom, but four on the top. Makes a little difference because these little peg teeth behind. Uh, this will come as a shock. They have short tail and long ears. We knew that. Not all of them, by the way. The pikes don't have very long ears. They kind of have a weird uh, anatomy on these guys. And the fact on the males is in most animals, most mammals, the testes are posterior to the penis. But in this case, they're not, they're anterior. So they kind of kind of put together in a weird way. And they produce two types of feces. I think I may have talked about this already, that uh, when they eat their food, uh, again, they're, they're eating grasses. Grasses are fully cellulose, and no animal on the face of the earth can eat cellulose or, or can digest cellulose. So every, every, we, we see all kinds of animals are herbivores, 
but they, to do that, they have to have some kind of help. Okay, so again, they have, their help is in, the, in their large intestine. There's bacteria in there that can break down that, the, uh, uh, the, the cellulose and turn it into volatile fatty acids, which they can then digest. But it's already in the large intestine. Of course, we passed absorption, which was in the small intestine. And so what they do is these species come out and they're kind of wet and big and floppy and gooey. They eat them because that, that, they're full of all the glass. The next time they come through, they're small and hard. And so they don't eat those. Uh, family, uh, first, uh, the board, uh, some of the taxon you know. So family Laporti, okay. And I want you to know our, this is the, one of the two rabbits we have around here. This is Sibilagus floridanus, eastern cottontail. And then the other one we have around here is Sibilagus aquaticus. They look very much alike, except, and of course you can't tell too much from here. Uh, Sibilagus aquaticus is big. Swamp rabbits are, are a bigger animal. And they have, relatively speaking, the ears smaller. Okay. So, uh, so again, morphological, rabbits are larger, smaller rounded ears. And the fur uh, is, is kind of yellowish. I never noticed this that much up here. And it's supposed to be coarser and all that, but this, this uh, cottontail that I took a picture of, it's got pretty coarse hair itself here. That's a, it's a, this was a picture we're taking up north. So it has a more voluminous color there. Behavior, okay, that's the big difference between them. If you are in an aquatic habitats and you see Rabbits, more than likely, they are swamp rabbits. Cottontails, tend to, cottontails are an animal of the edge. Everybody know what the edge is. Okay. The edge is where you have two habitats come together, and the classic edge I'm talking about here is usually a grassland area that comes into a forested area, and that the, the ecotone, the split between them, is the edge. And that's the world of, of cottontail rabbits, the eastern cottontail. Uh, the closer you get to the water, is the world of, of uh, swamp rabbits. Here's the swamp rabbit here. The other thing too is uh, in terms of their scat, their feces, uh, uh, cottontails, you see cottontail will just poop on the ground. But, uh, rab but uh, swamp rabbits don't. They poop on logs, up on logs. That's probably, it's, it's hypothesized that it's for scent marking, for territorial marking. And if you live in a wet habitat, you want to be up on the log so you does not wash away. Extremely good swimmers, which is cool. I've, I've got some videos of them uh, swimming through a, a beaver pond, which I thought was kind of cool. So uh, got that. Uh, and uh, there's, uh, of course, you're all too young to know this, but uh, we had a president once named Jay Carter. From Georgia. Georgia is a swamp rabbit country, and he went home one time, and he and his wife were out canoe uh, paddling around in a in a, a John boat, and of course all the press was there taking pictures of them. And this swamp rabbit came out and became known as the killer rabbit, kept coming out swimming, trying to get into their boat for whatever reason, and it was it was kind of funny, so it made it was on the news a whole lot. So it's back when we didn't hate our presidents as much as we do nowadays. <laughs> so it was, and so everybody thought it was real funny that Jimmy Carter got chased by the killer rabbit. This is the other family. So this, again, this is a poor day. Uh, those are the rabbits. Okay. The other family I want to talk about is Ocotonidae. Okay, Ocotonidae are the picots. And this is a pica. And so it looks much more like a rodent than it, than it does a rabbit, but it's but still, it is ligomorph here. Where do we find these? These are Neartic, but not, you know, so we think, oh, like here, no. Neartic as in really north Neartic. So they're, they're up in the mountains and they're over in the Paleartic as well, too. So, and so, they're, so these are in the Colorado mountains primarily, you see in the Rockies and in the coastal range of uh, Oregon and Washington. That's all I want to talk about them. It's a quick one. Okay. The next unit is not so quick. So I'll spend a little bit of time with it. And that's these guys here. Carnivora. Okay. So uh, we've talked a lot about carnivora. So um, 
uh, deal with some of the different things about them. So one of the characteristics of carnivora are their teeth. And this is, I've mentioned this, they have what are called carnassial teeth, okay? Uh, oftentimes what it is, it's the last upper molar, okay? Upper, upper premolar, so one, two, three, upper premolar four, and it's often the first molar. So this is premolar one, premolar two, and then this is the first premolar here, or first molar there. And what they do is they pass extremely close, there's another one, they have, they're very, very sharpened. Okay. They're, think of them as scissors. And this is, this is basically how they feed on all that. So, so again, when people tend to think, when they think of carnivora, they think of the canines, but I think I've probably, hopefully have beaten it through your head, but that's not it. Did I? I don't know, probably not. Okay. Okay. I wouldn't do that to my worst enemy. How about they have a good day? Because I'm going to be moving too fast. I will not do that. Okay. And so I'll try to get it posted. We may 